Hello everyone, welcome back to the kitchen table. Today on the kitchen table, we're actually going to do a bit of a bit of a field trip. Um, and uh, we're gonna be going and talking to a new startup commercial drone operator in the UK uh, about what that's like, uh, as well as being of interest to people in the UK who may be thinking about turning their hobby into a business. I thought it might also be interesting for some of you from other parts of the world just to see how the regulatory system operates in this country about commercial operations and uh, yeah that might be a bit of an interest to you especially if you're in the US where I know things are in a bit of a state of flux but before we go on and uh, and have a look at that it's of course the kitchen table and we always have a beverage and as I'm going to be uh, you know uh, playing some video that uh, to you that I, I filmed elsewhere I think I ought to sit back with a glass of wine and uh, today it's the uh, very nice 2014 Syrah Porcupine Ridge from and I'm almost certain I'm going to pronounce this wrongly, Birkenhutskluf from South Africa. So having mangled that, uh, cheers. Mm -hmm. That is very nice. So yes, I got, um, I got a call from um, uh, a guy called Barry Tyndall, who has set up a business called Sky Eye um, Video, uh, Aerial Video and Photography. Uh, he's based not too far away from me here in Henley in Oxfordshire in the UK. Uh, and he's very recently um, started his company and very, very recently got his permission from the Civil Aviation Authority to actually operate a drone commercially. Um, and I thought it would be really interesting to actually go and have a chat with him about what it was like to go through the, the hoops that he had to go through, some of the costs involved in starting up, some of the challenges, and actually maybe go and shadow him on doing a fairly simple job uh, and just to see the sort of things that he has to do, um, even for a simple job, uh, when you're when you're actually going to make a living out of flying the things. So um, yeah, I popped down to Henley, and the first thing we did was have a have a chat with Barry about uh, about how it all started. So here we are, not on the kitchen table. We're actually at Barry's table. So Barry Tyndall, thanks very much indeed for inviting me in to Sky no Eye Video Limited. Um, today we're really going to talk about what it means to run a professional commercial aerial photography and video business in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps you can just tell me a little bit first of all about Sky Eye Video and the company and when you started. And a bit okay, about Sky Eye Video Limited is my company um, based in Henley. Uh, I started it, I got my permissions for aerial work in May. Um, I started to study, study for it in October okay. um, and there is a bit of a process to go through to get permissions which is quite intense but you get there in the end yep. um, and so since since uh, October I've been doing aerial video and building a portfolio so people can actually see that I can do this because when, you, when you've got permissions you need to show people that you can do videos so um, the last seven months was um, studying and taking aerial videos learning how to fly a Phantom 2 Vision Plus version 3 which is the one I have um, and we're ready to go now. Got permissions. Uh, need to get out there and get some clients. Excellent. So obviously, to in order to make money from your, because anyone could go out and take aerial video as yeah. an amateur. We've all done that. Put it on YouTube. But it's a it's a bit of a different kettle of fish if you want to sell that as a service or sell those videos, yeah. isn't it? So yeah. what's I mean, you mentioned the permissions, but you you know you don't just write to the CAA and say I'm a good guy. Please let me make money. No. What's the what's the what's the process to get a permission? The Pro process everyone? is um, you have to enroll with a qualified entity. That um, I think there's there was three or four when I started doing it. There's a lot more than that now. Mm. Um, and you have to go through a training course and take a flight assessment and write an operations manual and write flight reference cards. Um, and then all, all about flying safely. That's the big key thing they talk about is making sure you can fly these things safely and not hurt anybody. So all the course is based around that, not trying to be clever with it, not trying to do loop the loops, just flying safely, um, which obviously you can then incorporate once you've got permissions into how you, how you make a video. But sure. um, it's not trying to be clever, it's trying to fly safely. And as you said, um, there's lots of people out there who've got these things and haven't got permissions and are flying them uh, and probably charge you money, I don't know. Um, but they're maybe not flying safely, I don't know. But they're certainly not doing it legally, but that's just that's sure. the way, the nature of the beast, I suppose. Sure. Um, but I'd rather do it properly and get yeah, yeah. a certification and permissions, which I've got. So now um, I have a, a kosher business that I, can, that I can hopefully earn some money out of. Excellent. So it's a two-step process then, really. You have, to, you have to get 
a qualification, a, a piece mm-hmm. of paper mm-hmm. um, from, from uh, as you said, a qualified entity, which is basically a training organisation that CAA yeah. have approved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, when you've got that though, that, 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 that isn't your permission, is it? Then that doesn't that still doesn't entail you to, to make no, money. They, do you then need to do something with that? Or yes, they then have to submit all the paperwork to the CAA, who then look at it, check it, and then give you permissions. Yeah, and there they've is never a, not apparently they've never not failed anybody who's gone through an NQE and passed a flight assessment. But it just takes time. As you say, I, my understanding from speaking to the CAA is there is currently an eight to twelve week. Yes, lag. it took me <laughs> in yes. getting the stamp because there's so many people. Exactly, that is that is. It took me eight weeks. Um, so well, I guess one of the things you've got to um, you've got to think about is not to um, assume that this is going to be a very quick process. So if you know if you've got a, if you've got a job lined up already and, and it's not going to be something you can knock on the head in two or three weeks and be ready to, to go out. Yeah, in the I field. mean. I'm sure there's people out there who are who are undergoing training and selling themselves already and booking jobs. I never did that. I, I never did that. I thought, right, let's before I start trying to tell everyone how good I am, I'd rather get my permissions and then start selling myself. Which, yeah. um, in the end, which which um, training organisation did you? Company I used was a company called Resource Group, based in South Wales, Cumbran. Okay. Um, very good. Can't, yeah. can't fault them at all. And mainly people who were in the army who were flying um, drones. Okay. In war zones, I believe. Yeah. But. Uh, um, very, in terms of ex army, everything's done by the book, and they make sure you learn what you need to learn, <laughs> <laughs> or else, <laughs> or else, or else we'll fly a drone over the end. But uh, no, so um, but it was good. It was fine. It was absolutely fine. They always responded to any questions you had when you left the course. Yeah. And and each of the it does seem as well slightly confusing that each of the entities seems to give you they have their own kind of qualification, their own certificate at the end. Right. So what have you what <laughs> have you got? I've got one of these. I've got one of these. This is great. It's um it's an RPQS which is a remote pilot qualification. Ah. S meaning small. Small. Yeah, there you go. So because I have a Phantom Two Vision Plus which is one and a half kilos. Yes. Um, but that's it. And so obviously you you're that. an RPQ now. That doesn't mean I've got CA permissions. That means I've got a, a certificate to fly a, San, a Phantom Two Vision Plus safely. The permissions permissions comes later. Uh-huh. Yes, um, so that and that, that's a key distinction, isn't it? That on its own, doing passing one of these courses and getting, you know, the RPQ there, yeah. you get the uh, I forget, there's, there, there are different acronyms, which BNUCS yeah. is the other yeah, one yeah, from another yeah. Yeah. Uh, another rival mm-hmm. organisation. The qualification just means you have shown them that you're a safe and competent safe, person. But you can't do it for money. You can't do it for money. You still mm-hmm. then need to take all of that paperwork that you've got, the certification, and push it to the so CA. They'll do that. Yeah. Do they do that for you they as part of the fee? Do they? They do that. Yeah. Okay, and I know. Some and then after they've submitted it, you're free to chase them as much as you want. <laughs> but clearly, I do because I was being patient. But uh, you're clear. But they will take you eight, take cool. you eight weeks probably. Yeah. So that's really interesting because I, I and I'm not sure how many people and I certainly didn't fully appreciate until I started looking into it that um, uh, as I say there's, there's there's a fair number of hoops you've got to jump through yep. not just to get the, the, the permission but even when you've got the permission that doesn't give you a blanket kind of let's just go out and, and do anything without any there's still a lot of pre-flight pre-job yep. preparation yep. Um, there is a lot of that yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, which is only right because otherwise it makes a mockery of the thing but the other thing that I think people forget about as well is on an ongoing basis though once you've got your permission and yep. you've set up your business or you're doing it as a sole trader, however you do it, that's that's not it. There's other ongoing costs, one of which I guess is important is insurance. Insurance, yes, fully insured here, the document in here, which cost me over £500. Um, it was more than £500, which is nearly £600, but then you get your certification, your permissions, and they reduce it a bit. Um, there's big excesses, so the insurance at the moment is quite new for these things. So yeah. it will probably become more competitive and come down, but it's over five hundred pounds at the moment. So that's another cost to factor in there into your business yeah. plan. So yeah. again, you already you've got to do a few jobs before you've covered yeah. I that, mean, that's, that cost and the cost of course. So So that so that what we talked about so far, the course and the insurance, we're looking at over two thousand pounds. Yeah. Plus a thousand pounds for the for the um, platform. Um I've got, bought all the, personally speaking, to do the job commercially, I bought the best editing software and for photos and videos, that's another cost. I bought a nice iMac. Yeah. Um, so I've invested sure. 7,000 pounds probably. Yeah, okay, so there's an element of being able to use your, your stuff. Yeah. So again, these are things I think people need to think about because I, I do think sometimes people get the impression, as I said, that, that you know, you, you, maybe it's a 1,500 quid, 2,000 pounds, and then on you go. But obviously there's ongoing, ongoing mm-hmm. stuff. Um, is there, do, does your permission for area work, does that last 
forever now, or is there a... There's a cost every year, right. but you don't have to retake an exam. But there is a cost. You sign up 120 quid, I think it is, for your first year, then the renewal is about 80 okay. for a year. But I'm not sure. I don't think you have to re... You have to submit the number of flying hours per year, which is about 40, I think, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to keep records of things you do. So flight logs are imperative. You've got to write down every flight you do. Okay. Um, and the batteries you use and the battery life, um, so the battery t- or time in the air for the flight, which battery you used. And then when you charge the batteries, you have to record how many lights were left on the batteries. So when you charge it up, um, uh, how long you fly it for. So it's kind of all that, all that needs to be recorded. Okay, so that all needs to be logged down as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. And then, it's a bit of a nuisance, yeah, yeah. but it has to be done. I yeah. understand why. The other thing that I think people forget about, particularly in the UK, um, uh, why they would forget about it in the UK, it, I don't know because we have plenty of it, is weather. Yeah. So, of course, you know, yeah. we, don't, we, we haven't got the privilege of living in sunny Southern California. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, you can have jobs lined up and, and spec'd and customers champing at the bit and everything's ready, and then you rock up and, and you can't fly because. When would be some of the circumstances you can't fly? I mean, what, do you have do you have set limits for wind? Do you have sure, weather yeah. conditions? My what? particular platform, they recommend not flying over 17 miles per hour, which I think is Gale Force 4, um, which is pretty windy. Yeah. Um, but you, you, have a, you have to have a, a, a wind and no, and no, no, and no, 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 to check every time you fly, because you, I've flown before and I've held it up and it said 10. I thought, okay, <laughs> it's a bit windy but it can handle up to 17 miles an hour, so you don't fly over that. Mm. Uh, you can't fly in the rain, you really can't fly in the rain, so if you've got a job booked and it's raining, you can't do the job. We know at the moment that there's been lots of um, press, bad press about people, yeah. not presumably with permissions, I suspect, um, who've uh-huh. been flying their, uh, their, their Phantom, and it normally is, sadly, their Phantoms are over football yeah. stadia, um, rock concerts, Airports. All sorts of stuff. We, we <laughs> luckily so far in the UK, not actually over them. There was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and that kind of thing. But your permission, as it stands, does that give you kind of carte blanche to go and do any kind of no, event, no. any photography? Not at all. No, it's still quite stringent. I've got a smaller platform, so anything under seven kilograms gives you more flexibility. You can fly to within fifty meters of a person, um, and if you get there permission or they say under your control you can fly closer than that um, on a smaller platform less than 7k so if you've got a 7k platform it's 150 meters which will affect obviously a lot because uh, three times as far away mm. um, outside outside events anything less than a thousand people with a small platform like a phantom you can fly to 50 meters if it goes over a thousand people it's 150 meters you know you don't just because you've got the permission for aerial work it doesn't give you permission to film everything in no, any location with okay. One of the other things that's a bit, a bit mythical status because nobody ever gets to see one because it's actually part of the yeah. part of the criteria for passing the assessment is the mythical operations manual, yeah. which everybody who um, everybody who who uh, runs a commercial aerial business yeah. has to have. Yeah. But am I right in saying that these are all quite closely guarded documents because, you know, it's quite a difficult thing to write? I mean, well, there's a, they're going to be pretty generic, um, but they're going to be specific for each business. But it's all dependent on how big your business is. If you've got one person, you only need to write an operation manual based on one pilot, hmm. um, possibly an assistant. So it's fairly straightforward. If you've got a business that has two or three pilots, Got to contain a lot more information about everybody. And Brilliant. That's re- thank you very much for that. That's really useful. I think the next step for us is to um, hopefully be able to just briefly look at the sort of preparation for an actual job that yes. you've got, the background prep. So um, yeah, thank you very much, and we'll 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 join you again when we're when we're looking at how you actually prep up for a for a real job. A pleasure. Okay. So in order to um, do a commercial job, the CAA want you to record everything which is a good thing, so it's good practice to, to do that. Um, there's a number of forms that uh, need to be uh, completed. Firstly, you get a job, you register it, you have a job number, um, you put your client's name down, the tasks you're going to do, uh, when you're doing it, the time you're doing it, and when you've finished it, you tick it, so you've completed the job, so that's a pretty basic form. Um, and this is more important and more detailed. This is a pre-site survey form. Um, which recalls all the details of where you're going to fly, the job you're doing. I'm just going to fade Barry down there because um, a lot of what he's going through is actually listed in his operations manual. And that's, that's a document that you've got to put some work in to actually get qualified. 
uh, to be able to apply for a permission for aerial work. So I didn't want to give too much of his uh, hard work away to anybody else who is watching. But you can see I've sped it up five or six times and there's still a lot of information that needs to be done. He's talking about checking the, doing a site survey, checking ordnance survey maps, airspace, weather, getting permissions from landowners and residents and occupiers. There's lots to be done, uh, even for a simple job like the one that uh, we then went out to do. So here we are. Uh, it was a job for the local council. They wanted some aerial shots of uh, their, their, their allotments that they've got. Uh, and so Barry was obviously uh, following his procedures and safety first. You can't be safe without a high visibility jacket, of course. Um, then when you're on site, you have to double check that everything you've done pre-site is still valid, looking at trees and obstacles and other people uh, and all those bits and pieces. Uh, you then got to choose your takeoff and landing spot and then kind of everything, all your distances run from there. Um, you also have to secure the area. Now, I'm quite lucky in this little spot because it's actually bounded by a gate and there's, there's only one sort of real access. But even so, uh, you're going to put a sign up warning people across the gate and sort of barring entry there. And then we've got another couple of signs to go out across basically any point where somebody might come in and not see what you're doing. As well as for safety, it's also quite good so you're not distracted. I don't know about you, but when I fly recreationally, just buzzing around, I get lots of people coming up to me if I'm in a sort of a, a area where public can access and chatting and what is it and isn't it cool and wanting to see it. So obviously if you're doing a, a job, first aid kit as well, always be prepared. Um, bizarrely as well, it's also advisable to have a fire extinguisher. I, you know, lipo fire, I guess, uh, could, could happen, but it, it's there. So you're covered for insurance purposes as well. As you can see there, look, you know, you've got signs for every point that you might enter. This is actually an RF analyzer, and it's something that, again, is recommended to check that you've got no strong signals that might block your control frequency. Um, so that's pretty good. And the anemometer, as we spoke about earlier, comes out for a quick wind check to make sure that you're in the limits. Um, and then as part of his procedure, Barry does a compass dance. You can see from, if those of you who've watched my previous video, he uses the one-armed bandit. That's the one-armed bandit. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll put a link on the screen. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, you know, if you're moving from place to place doing jobs, then there's a good chance that you might, uh, that you might pick up some different electromagnetic fields and so on. And plus you can't really survey under the ground, so it's maybe worth doing uh, in these cases. And then uh, when we've all cleared in the final check, it's off we go into the wide blue yonder. And uh, and then for this job, there's a mix of some stills and, and some video. Uh, not flying over a great area, uh, but you know, you've got to keep, uh, keep alert and keep your eyes on the aircraft. And here's some of the, just a few clips from the video that he took. It's by no means the full thing, but it was produced for somebody else. So I just put a, a few bits and pieces. Uh, and you can see some establishing shots. And you can see why an aerial shot is great. It shows the layout, it shows the size and the scope. And after a few bits and pieces are coming in for a, coming in for a gorgeous two point landing here. Steady, steady, steady. Oh, a little hop, skip and a jump. Uh, and we're down. And uh, yeah, that was it. A, a great sort of uh, little, little insight into what you have to do commercially. So a big thanks to uh, to Barry there. Uh, that was that was that was great. Thank you very much for letting us come and uh, come and talk to you as Sky Eye. Um, Barry's actually been a uh, subscriber and a channel patron, a supporter of the channel for quite some time. So it was really actually nice to see him kind of take things through from from. Uh, doing it from a hobby to, to making it a business. I um, hope you found that interesting. Um, if you've got any questions, um, um, I think Barry said he's more than happy to answer anything that he can. If you want any specific questions for him or you've got any questions around getting qualified and the things that you need to do in the UK um, to, to, to make money from your, from your drone, then can you let me, let me know in the comments below. Uh, also, if you're not from the UK, what do you think of the, of the, you know, of the, the current state of affairs where you are? Um, and what do you think of the of the system that we've got over here as a as a possible solution for everyone being able to do it? Notice Barry doesn't have a private pilot's license, so um, he's <laughs> it's not quite as draconian as in some jurisdictions I know. So uh, there we go. Many thanks indeed. I really appreciate your 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 views and your thoughts and your comments below. Many thanks, and uh, we'll see you again soon back on the kitchen table. Until then, cheers.
but you you have a, you have to have a, a wind and num and nominal. And, 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 and one of those. Yeah.